could be super casual, guys. That's perfect. Um, so, I am Keith Pomios. This is Song about the Roasters. Thank you, Kim, for inviting us. Um, I um, have been at full disclosure. You can call me or email me a week ago and said, this has got to be about Rwanda. We're an all-female school, and it's going to really resonate. So I, I took what I usually do and kind of threw it out the window and revamped it to um, fit this Rwanda story. But I had not been to Rwanda yet. I was supposed to go last year. Things fell through. Um, and I'm, my goal is to get there this summer, uh, stop in Ethiopia, and then head to Rwanda. I uh, was able to get um, some actual pictures of farmers that grow bafi that are in some of your blends, and definitely in one in bafi uh, in one of your cafes. Um, so we'll, we'll put some faces to the coffee, which is kind of cool, and um, talk a little bit about the industry, just give you guys a background on like, the whole coffee industry, what it's all about. And then um, talk a little bit about us, but not too much. I don't want to bore you guys. And, um, and then uh, I've got a short video if we have time at the, at the end, and if not, we can cut that out and just do like, questions and answers if you have any questions, and uh, go from there. So, some coffee roasters, us. Um, some background information, just, just kind of, you're not gonna remember any of this, but it'll just give you a, a 30,000 foot view of what the industry's all about right now. Um, world production statistics, over half a trillion cups of coffee are consumed annually, worldwide. Okay, so just kind of absorb these numbers. Um, 145 million bags are produced annually, which equates to about 10 million tons of coffee. And the average of coffee is, is either 130 or 150 pound bags, depending on origin. Uh, so just do the math real quick, and it comes out to about 10 million tons of coffee, uh, 145 million bags. Um, that equates to 21 billion pounds of coffee. 80% of that coffee is grown by small lot farmers. So when you think about orange, oranges, when you think about you know, major produce, uh, there's these agri farms that are huge worldwide. Uh, just look in North America. Like, if she wants to show her, if you have someone who wants to show her the video, can you please talk to the mic? Okay, I will talk in the mic. Sorry. Uh, that's all right. I have Thank a freshman you. telling me what to do. I don't know. I know. Um, okay, so um, so what's a, what's a micro farm? Uh, micro farm is uh, a hectare of property, which is two and a half acres or less. So 80% of that 145 million bags, 21 billion pounds, are grown in these small family farms. 125 million people employed in the coffee industry at the farm level worldwide. So it's not a small sector. Um, coffee production is uh, slavery and, and child labor. 61% of coffee farmers, which we'll get into later, but 61% of coffee farmers are producing at a net loss. So the market has been, and we'll have a slide in shortly, uh, has been very weak, particularly the last couple of years. Um, to give you an idea of cost structures, the floor number for fair trade, everybody knows what fair trade is, is $1.60 a pound right now. We actually create pro formas and business models for each of these small lot farmers, these family farmers who you, you have interns who will work with them. And um, overall, worldwide, average cost for production, break even is $1.68 right now. So even the fair trade floor price is not enough to, to make these farms sustainable. Uh, another quick number, less than five cents per cup on a $2.50 cup of coffee that you get at Starbucks, and if you can get it that cheap, uh, it goes back to the farm. And the average age of the farm, which is becoming an issue, is 58 years old right now worldwide. So this is a chart of the C market. So most coffee companies will trade off of this. This is the futures market, um, the commodity market is traded on the uh, IC exchange. And uh, you can see the, the peaks and the valleys, uh, but if you, if you look at um, over time, uh, the average price has been somewhere around dollar, which is right here. 
um, below and above. The problem is when you have the peaks, the farmer doesn't participate. The trader makes the money. So it's the guys on Wall Street who are making the profits. And the last thing that the Wall Street wants to see is a flat market or a stable market because they can't make money there. They make money when the market goes down. They make market when the, come, the, the, the market goes up. But on a stable market, you're not making anything. Stable market is what the farmers want. So there's a conflict there it's between the actual people with the money, which are the traders, and the actual farmers who are the producers. How do you, how do you solve that? Um, so again, some more stats. Again, I don't expect anybody to remember any of these, but give you an overall picture. Coffee's grown in over 70 countries. 60% is the four of the top four countries, which are Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, and Indonesia. 70% um, of that coffee is exported. 30% is, is uh, held for consumption in those countries. Um, producing countries' economies depend heavily on uh, uh, to improve health, education, infrastructure, and social services because their economies are really based on coffee. Um, and, and as I just said, they're not making enough to even break even in their household, so how are they able to support the economy of the country when they can't put food on their own table? Uh, U.S.'s largest importer of coffee. Sustainability definition. Um, Google it. So this is out of Webster's or something. The ability to maintain at a certain rate or level avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. And that's kind of standardized. You know, when I go to schools, I, I usually ask for a small group here, so I'm not gonna really pick on anyone. But you know, what's your definition of sustainability? People talk about uh, the low carbon footprint, uh, the, the saving the rainforest, uh, global warming, and all really important, and all things that we need to address. My definition, and this is just me, of sustainability is starts in the home, starts in the farm, starts with these micro 61 for 60 percent or whatever, 85 percent of our micro farmers in, in the world, and that's financial sustainability. If you can't make enough money from your small crop to sustain your family with clothing, with health care, with education, with food, then you're not going to be able to sustain your farm. You're going to have to leave your farm, go into Medellin or, or Bogota or one of the big cities in, in, in all these countries and, and work as a laborer or do something where you can actually make some money. So financial sustainability is really one of the cornerstones of what we're all about, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um, so our founding, 1947 to 2002. So when I started in this business, I need to stand by the microphone, forgot. Uh, when I started in this business um, was in 1990, so I'm like 100 years old, and um, was running this company that was founded in 1937. And we were moving to a new facility that I had built to consolidate a few roasting plants and distribution warehouse in 2002. And they, we were cleaning out the basement of the original company that was founded in 37, and they brought me up invoices from 1947. So I'm looking in my left hand, these invoices, they were from Peru, Guatemala, Brazil, and Colombia. In my right hand, Invoices from Peru, Guatemala, Brazil, and Colombia from 2002. Um, same regions of the country, and if I did enough homework, probably some of the same families two generations later. And there was a one cent price difference in the coffee. Not adjusted for inflation, it was actually a one cent price difference. And up until that point, my thought process was I am an entrepreneur, white privileged male in the United States, making really good money, um, profiting on the backs of people that I consciously chose to never meet or get to know or understand. And when I saw that, it just hit me like a brick that, you know, I'm living this great life, looking for the highest quality coffee I could buy, the lowest price I could pay so I could make the biggest margin for my company never thinking about what the source was all about, what, what the families, these 125 million people around the world were all about. So I started doing homework. 
uh, and decided and, and interviewed actually many farmers because I'd never been to, to his origin before, never talked to a farmer before, and started getting an understanding of what their needs were, and there were hundreds of needs. But the common denominators were living wages, education for their children, like any parent would want, and some type of, of environmental sustainability, you know, to, to preserve the land that they own. Um, we, uh, I, I sold out of the business in uh, 2003, 2004, uh, realizing that I couldn't change the business model that I had fast enough because I was in those accounts like diners and hotels and restaurants and convenience stores that, again, they cared about highest quality coffee, lowest price that they could pay. Um, so I decided to just ditch the whole thing and start all over again. And I, my, my curve of affecting actual people on the ground would be a lot faster. So I uh, took a couple years off, uh, took five years off almost, and uh, went up to school in Boston for a couple years to try to figure out how do you take a commodity-based business, which coffee is, and everything becomes commoditized. This computer is a commodity, the chairs you're sitting on are commodities. Everything becomes commoditized over time. We're actually dealing in a commodity. So how do you take that, differentiate it, go to market, figure out what you're gonna do with the farmers, which we kind of figured that those were gonna be the three things, the, the living wages, the education, and the uh, rainforest preservation, and who, where was our target market? Where were we going to be able to like engage best with that mission? And who had the same value systems as we have? Or we have? Um, and it was the college and university market, basically. Uh, you know, I, we did a demographic study at the time. This was 10 plus years ago. And it was the 18 to 30 year old who were mission driven consumers. You know, you cared about what you're buying, not just buying. And, um, Price was always an issue, but it wasn't the first issue. It was, you know, down the line, two, three, four, two talks down the line. So um, uh, we really focused at that point on the college university market and what it was all about and how we could affect that market without Starbucks kind of money or Pete's Coffee kind of money, which were our two biggest competitors at the time, and they still are. Um, so. Uh, farmers financial sustainability people and process we're going to talk about some people today we're going to talk about some process of actually what happens on the farm um, one thing that i've gotten to know over the last eight nine years that i've been to origin is the actual passion and commitment that these farmers put into every single bean they pick it's just incredible there's a lot of ways to mess it up down the supply chain from the way it's being brewed to the way we roast it to the way it's being distributed um, but the, it starts with like passion, love, and, and, and really dedication to putting the highest quality product out possible. Um, very labor intensive, and we'll talk about that shortly as well. I keep saying that, but we will. Um, cycle of poverty. Um, the, 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 the industry, coffee industry, has been depressed for you know well over 100 years. Um, since you know, I started tracking it, which was when the futures started, which is about 100 years ago, uh, the futures market. And um, when they started trading it as a commodity on the exchange is when they it really got the price and, and there's no money in the farm. <coughs> so what, is, what, what do living wages provide these farmers? Shelter, housing, uh, food to put on the table for their families, uh, clothing for themselves and their children, uh, health care in different formats, not what we know of as health care here, uh, but a, a form of health care which may be a local nurse, uh, maybe a, a doctor who's 20 kilometers away, but there's, there's, there's somebody that they can go to uh, when there are need, health care needs. Um, education, that's a big thing for us, and that's education for their children. Most of these children will start working the farm eight to nine years old, they'll live to their mid 50s, early 60s, which is their life expectancy, and then the next generation comes in. So they don't have the opportunity in most coffee growing regions in these micro farms, which are in the rainforest in the middle of literally nowhere um, for a local school, or you know, never mind a college, university, uh, even, even a K to five school. 
Um, uh, farm irrigation, fertilization, and harvest um, are you know just basically um, you know reinvesting in their crops and um, making sure that they have the highest yielding coffee possible with the highest quality so that they can get the highest price. Um, environmental sustainability, uh, we engage with all our coffees and all our farmers uh, grow their coffee within the canopy of the rainforest. Um, so there's no clear cutting rainforest. So if you look at Peru, for example, Peru has the highest rate uh, per capita of organic farms in the world. But they'll clear cut a rainforest to grow an organic farm. And to me, that makes absolutely no sense. So we, we're really careful about the you know, rainforest and preservation of the rainforest. And everybody saw what happened in Brazil over the summer. Um, you know, it, it's a travesty. And we need the rainforest to be healthy uh, for this planet to survive. Uh, reforestation, uh, we work with reforestation programs with, with many of our farmers. And that's not just replanting coffee plants. Um, you know, it's plantains and bananas and uh, any kind of vegetation that they, they, they can plant. Um, natural fertilization, all our coffees are not organic. We have several organic coffees and we're certified organic. Um, but many of the, the small uh, whole farmers can't afford the actual process to get organic certified. So yes, they use natural fertilization, but they can't use that beautiful USDA logo. So I have a whole issue with that sometimes. Um, but we make sure that not only for the health of the farmer, but for the health of the consumer, that the, 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 the plants are fertilized naturally. And that's usually with uh, worm farms, uh, earthworm farms, um, and composting, and, um, uh, and that's, those are the two big ones. Um, natural irrigation, um, there's no sprinkler system. So all, this, all these plants are either uh, uh, irrigated uh, in, in water with um, rain, um, which usually many of these coffee regions have uh, rain seasons. Um, and that's usually enough. But um, if not, there's also mountain water, and that mountain water gets diverted uh, through bamboo systems many times uh, to trickle down the mountain because all these farms are on mountains uh, in, at different elevations, um, and it's it's. It's kind of archaic, but it works. Um, land use, they want to maximize land use, um, and that's with growing other vegetation that they can consume for food. Uh, uh, cows, um, they can use the manure for fertilization and the milk uh, for, for drinking, and um, uh, also for heating and cooking. Uh, the dead wood from the rainforest, they use for both of those. Um, our sustainability, so I was talking to you guys earlier at dinner, is we are, our goal is to be carbon neutral by the end of this year. Uh, we have a plan in place uh, for uh, solar, system, uh, solar panels. Uh, we're gonna overcompensate because we use natural gas in our roasting process. To give you an idea, and I have a picture later on of our coffee roaster, uh, it's, it's a very high-end hybrid roaster a typical roaster of that size anywhere in the world is going to run around 3 million BTUs of natural gas an hour. We run approximately 300,000 BTUs of natural gas an hour. So even without the solar program that we're putting in place, we're running significantly less natural gas than, than really any other roaster of our size. Um, we have zero emissions. So coffee is a big chemistry experiment. It's about 16 to 17 minutes for a roasting coffee from green to finish. About 1,400 chemical reactions go on during that 16, 17 minute time frame. There's also exhaust from that, and that exhaust has particulates in it. And the EPA requires 28% or less particulates, uh, percentage-wise, uh, in that exhaust to make it legal, okay, uh, according to EPA standards. Um, most coffee roasters will use afterburners, and all that is is a simple stack, and it burns the, the smoke. Um, it runs at like 3.3, 3.4 million BTUs an hour um, of natural gas, and uh, you can only get the particulates down to about 12%. Um, I used to use it in my old company, and I just, I didn't want to do that anymore. So we actually had design for us, um, catalytic uh, scrubbers, uh, cleaners, so we have two of them, 
So we have zero emissions. So we've got, we're using significantly less natural gas and we, we put no pollutants in the air. Um, byproducts of roasting are chaff, which is like the center of the bean. It's a little like flaky thing. Um, like think of a popcorn kernel when it opens up, that flake that's in the middle, that's, that's similar to what chaff is. Uh, we have uh, free range chicken farmers that pick it up twice a week and use it in instead of using wood chips for the, the chickens. And now they're not cutting trees down or killing trees uh, for wood chips, they're using our chaff, which you know, we have a little more use for. Um, we have burlap bags, um, are recycled, um, nurseries pick them up, they use them for bulbs on plants, they use them for uh, uh, barriers for weeds and, and, uh, and flower beds. Uh, arts and crafts people pick them up, so we reuse all the burlap that the coffee, the green coffee actually comes in, and we have a full recycling program for corrugated and paper. Uh, the Solar Project 2020, I touched on carbon neutral goal by the end of this year, I touched on that as well. So start with why. So, you know, I told you earlier that we have these three legs that we stand on. I don't want to sell anybody coffee because they like the flavor of our coffee or because we have the best price. We want to sell coffee to those who believe in what we believe. And we believe in the center of this, our why. Why Sun Coffee exists. We exist for three things, living wages, uh, education for the children, coffee farmers, and rainforest preservation. If you align with that, then the rest is kind of great. Our, our, our you know, business proposition and go-to-market you know, differentiation is that middle uh, circle, uh, which is you know, for college, this is directly just the colleges, but you know, we have internship programs, ambassador programs, scholarships at all our schools. Um, uh, we, you know, I lecture a ton during the course of the year, you wouldn't know it by tonight because we're doing something different. But um, so we developed an educational program. We have a full curriculum on sustainable fair labor practices, 14 week coursework. Uh, it's being used at Ivy League schools, it's being used at community colleges. Um, mostly modules of it within current coursework, um, but some schools are using it as a standalone course. Uh, so it's a full syllabus, and we support that syllabus. Um, so that's, that's our differentiating proposition. And by the way, we're selling, we think, great coffee. Okay, but you can buy great coffee pretty much anywhere. So it's not about the great coffee, and it's not about the price, it's about the middle of that circle. We, you, you align with us on, on that, and we align with you, then we're gonna have a great relationship, and we're gonna benefit somebody that neither of us may ever get to know in the world. So, this is my Kim special, Rwanda. Okay, just a, a map of Rwanda. And actually, I, I didn't realize this, and this is just doing some homework this past week, is Rwanda has the oldest rainforest in Africa, which I did not know. Uh, this is a map of Burundi uh, in the south and, and uh, Rwanda in the north. Um, but it, you just, you know, knowing nothing about geography, you, you, there's a lot of green there, okay? Uh, you don't see any big cities or, or, or anything else going on. It's, it's, it's a lot of forestry. Um, all our farms look like this. Uh, this is a typical looking farm that some coffee roasters engages with. This is the canopy of the rainforest. And beneath that canopy is where the coffee plants actually grow. And it's more difficult to grow within the canopy because you have a lot more shade. And coffee bean, coffee trees love the sun. So the yield on those coffee trees is less than it would be for a clear cutted rainforest, you know, and a coffee tree sitting in the sun all day. Just bring you through the cycle, a coffee tree will grow to anywhere between 12 or 9 and like 16, 17 feet uh, tall. Um, it will, it has leaves. Um, it will blossom annually. Some, like in Colombia, you might get two blossoms a year. Blossom turns into a cherry, which starts green, turns yellow, then turns red. When it turns red, it's ripe. It's ready for harvest. Within each cherry on the left, there's two of those seeds. Think of a cherry that we eat here. Um, there's one pit. Well, there's two in a coffee cherry. And um, they're, the flat sides are butted up against each other, and then the skin is around the outside. And it's actually a, it's a fruit, and it's sweet. It's, 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 the skin is sweet. And you can see the, 
the, the honey finish on that. Um, it's, it's key for these farmers to clean that coffee within 48 hours. And I'll tell you why in a couple slides. But uh, that honey, before it gets process, finished processed and, and exported, needs to be cleaned and dried. Uh, from the far right picture, where you actually get your first leaf, to the time this tree will yield its first coffee beans is typically around three years. So the, the farmers are constantly replanting. Typical life of, of, a, of a tree is um, anywhere from 15 to 20 years. Um, at you know 20 years, and that's taking good care of the trees, fertilization, irrigation. Um, they'll cut them down to the stub and then they'll start sprouting again. And, and then alongside that coffee tree that was cut down, they'll have a new coffee tree growing. And that'll be the third year of that coffee tree, so they know it's going to yield coffee. This, this tree here is about a, uh, a year old, uh, no beans on it, no flowers on it yet. Um, probably standing about two feet tall. Um, this is a taller tree. This is somewhere around 12 feet tall. And think about it, they don't have land ladders. It's all hand-picked. And it's not really a tree where you can climb up it. So it's a challenge to get those beans that are on top. And again, every bean, each bean is hand-picked. There's no automation. Uh, some more pictures. I kind of like this one because it gives you an indication of what harvest is all about. So. Um, I don't know, what's, in Grace, what's your name? Bethany. Bethany? Betsy. Betsy, okay, so Betsy's our coffee farmer today. And we're gonna go out into the rainforest at around six o'clock in the morning um, as a group. And we're gonna assign Betsy an area that's about a third the size of this room. And she's gonna pick coffee beans from six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night, only the red cherries. Don't forget, okay? Then two weeks later, we're going to bring Betsy back to the same area because they ripen at different times. She's going to pick the next round of red cherries. And then two weeks later, the next round of red cherries. It takes four months, typically, to, to, to harvest all the red cherries off of a coffee tree. Okay? And that yields one pound of roasted coffee. I crunched the man hours once, and like my calculator ran out of digits. I mean, it's literally billions and billions of man hours. Um, hand picked, okay? So, and each bean is looked at before it's harvested. So it's not like they're just shaking a tree and whatever falls out, they're gonna take. They, they're, they're literally looking at every single bean. So when we're in dining and I'm in the roasting, we don't wanna screw that up. We want to make sure that we, we brew the best cup that we can brew for the consumer. If for no other reason, to show the farmer that we're, really, we're, 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 we're taking their pride and we're bringing it right through the supply chain. Once it's harvested, there's a couple different things that can happen. Uh, these are the red cherries. This is um, actually a picture not in, um, in uh, Rwanda. This is in Nicaragua, but I wanted to show it to you. This is about as automated as they ever get. And what this machine does is they dump the coffee, red cherries, into the, into the machine. Uh, mountain water is used. It's like a big screw logger. And it rotates, and as it rotates, it cuts the skins off the cherries. And the skins go one direction, the cherries go another direction, and then the washing process starts. Um, this is actually a channel for one of the screws, and you can see this um, as it's starting to get cleaned. Um, then it runs through a mill type unit uh, where there's more water used, and all the water, and regardless of the country this happens to be, this, these few pictures are from Nicaragua, is the water is recycled. They typically will have uh, reservoirs of water on the property put a bioenzyme in, so it's not potable water, but it's, it's, it can be used for, for, uh, for irrigation purposes. Um, and they'll take that water and then reuse it for, um, uh, for the plants. Um, some finished uh, cleaning, you know, high-tech uh, uh, stones embedded in cement. Uh, they take the coffee with water and they rush it over the, the stones 
scrape off any residual skins on the, uh, on the coffee. Then the coffee beans go in one direction uh, and the skins go in another direction. Um, this is uh, back to Rwanda now. This is a drying station. And uh, they, you, after you wash the coffee, it needs to dry fully before it goes to what they call in, in, uh, in, in, in South America, Beneficio and Rwanda. I'm not sure what the technical name is, but it's basically the, the final cleaning, finishing, and packaging of that coffee is for export. And what they do there is take every bean, even though it's clean from the skin, has this chaff, like I told you, in the middle of the bean, when it roasts, it opens up and there's a chaff in the middle, where there's a skin of chaff on the outside of the bean as well. And that has to be removed, because if it wasn't, and I roasted it at 470 degrees, it's highly combustible. We have roast fires all the time. So that needs to be cleaned out, and I'll show you how, to, how it's going to be cleaned momentarily. Um, this is uh, back to uh, Rwanda, uh, the, the Conde Kawa, which is a cooperative. We're going to show some pictures shortly. Um, this is a sorter. So what they'll do is they'll put the beans in this, and you know we're not talking high tech here. And it has different like uh, screen sizes in it, and the larger beans stay on top, the smaller beans fall through. The larger the bean, typically the higher price you're going to get for the coffee. So they'll package those separately and look for a higher price on those particular coffees. Um, then the, 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 the dry coffee now goes to these, these processing areas around the country. And they go, they, they want, they, they go to get fully dry and they, they actually lay them out on these, these uh, tarps, uh, black tarps. And uh, for you know a week, week and a half, somewhere around there, um, to make sure that they're completely dry. And they obviously don't do it during rain season; they do it during their, their hot, dry season. Um, and how do you get that skin off this chair? Well, you have people like this who basically take that pile and all day long for 12 hours, instead of being in the field like Betsy was. Um, Zach is got this hooded mask thing going and he's flipping the piles over with a broom for 12 hours, and as he flips the pile over, the chaff is so, it's so brittle, the chaff basically breaks off, and the coffee is technically clean. Um, it's also done by hand, and that's just moving the coffee back and forth, and as it moves back and forth, the chaff breaks off. And you can see beds here as well. The skins, like I said, go in another direction. They go into piles, typically, and they're used for fertilization. Well, the skin itself, not great fertilization, but if you introduce worms to it, and worms live for about 30 days, and they, a lot of these areas and farms, even the micro farms, will have, um, have worm farms, and they'll take worms and introduce them to the, to the skins, I don't know a lot about worms. I just know they live for about 30 days, they poop, they reproduce, and they die. Uh, and, and then that becomes, that becomes a compost, a, a, a fertilization, which is all hand packed. So you have 500 trees in the rainforest. You're going into that rainforest with sacks of this fertilization on your back, and you're hand packing twice a year each individual tree with the fertilizer. That's the water that's uh, reused in, in the uh, reservoirs. That's the, heat, the, the dead wood from the, from the farms. Um, so people, so these are some of the people. This is actually uh, uh, from the, the Conde Kawa uh, Cooperative. And this is uh, the Singua Maria. And the information that I was able to get from her, and, and this is why I'm not super comfortable about this tonight because I've, in, in virtually every other country, I haven't been to Sumatra yet, but I'm, I'm going to do Ethiopia and Rwanda this coming summer, is I want to get to know these, these actual people. So I, there, were, there were associates of mine that were in Rwanda, and they took some of these pictures and gathered the information for us. And I was, up until last week, I never really pulled it together, but Kim gave me a good reason to do it, so I did it. And, um, and I've got some just stats. So we're, uh, you know, in Rwanda, the big problem was the genocide, obviously. So in, in their culture, men typically worked the farm, women stayed at home with, with the children. It's different in every country that we engage with. Um, 
when they, the genocide was 20 plus years ago, you know, most of the men died in, in what they call the war of genocide. Um, left these women, uh, when they were, you know, many of them left the country and they came back two years later to their, their homes. Most of the homes were gone, but they tried to resettle and start up all over again. They did it with children on their back, the ones that survived, and without a husband. And also without really knowing how to grow the coffee with high quality, good yield, and get a good price for it. So they really started all over again 20 plus years ago. Um, so uh, uh, Basinga, uh, Basingua um, started farming in 1974. Her husband died in the war. Um, she, um, she, the sole source of income uh, for, for her family is her, her plantation. And um, she joined a cooperative in 2000, which allowed her to start increasing the quality of her coffee through education and also getting a better price than she would in that C market that we looked at earlier. Um, her goal right now is because she has a, a sustainable, financially sustainable crop, is to develop solar panels, put solar panels at her home uh, so she can have hot water uh, and uh, for cooking purposes and, um, and, and have electricity and have, be able to have lights and some type of power in her home. So that, that's, that's her goal at this point. Um, this is uh, Mukamira Rosa. She was born in 1934. Uh, and these are all, by the way, farmers that, that we engage with buying coffee, which ends up at St. Ben's. So these are not just some random people. These are actual people that have grown part of the coffee that you guys drink here. Um, she developed a mulching uh, for fertilization process, which was kind of uh, ahead of her time. She started with 100 trees. She now has 200 trees. And when you think about it, how, many, how much did you get out of a tree? One pound, right? So she's yielding 200 pounds approximately a year of coffee. That's her income for the year. Keep that in your head. Um, she has four children, or she has five children, four of them were unable to go to school because she just didn't have the resources to do that. Uh, her fifth is now uh, on schedule to graduate from university. So she's been able to take what she had land-wise, create this farm, develop the farm, and create enough funds to at least have her last child go to, go to school. Um, <clears throat> This is Nakaboni Colette. She started farming um, coffee at 15 years old uh, in 1969 and um, has grown her farm from 20 coffee trees to 350 coffee trees today. Uh, after the war, she was left with no house, um, no income, and um, she they really had nothing left on the farm. Everything was decimated because she had left the farm for several years so she could survive the war. Um, her biggest challenges are paying school fees for her children to go to school. That's her number one goal. Uh, and again, these are, this is information that we, I've gotten secondhand. Um, I will have a lot more, invite me back in September and, and I, will, I will have a lot more because I will actually meet many of these women. And they're really wonderful women. And the women really run Rwanda. And I kind of wish they could run every country, but you know, they, they've done a tremendous job in bringing that country from ashes to where it is today. Um, quote from her, we have great taste in coffee because we work hard to make it the highest quality. We want to build good relationships with women consumers so they know how hard we work to make a living from coffee. So the woman in, in this country in particular, um, it's somewhat that way in Peru as well, but it, it, the, the bond between the woman in this country is really strong and they support each other 
in any way possible, whether it is through educating and helping each other to increase crop quality and yield, to helping with children, to helping with food, to helping with clothing, health care. Uh, they're a family. They, they work as, you know, it, it, it takes a village, you know, Hillary Clinton 20, 15 years ago, it, it, they actually put that into practice in Rwanda. This is Makahiwa Cecile. Uh, she started farming in 1999 with 90 trees. Uh, she has 250 trees now. So you can see all these farmers, they're micro lot farmers. And they're, at 250 trees, she probably has half a hectare of property, um, not a full hectare. Hectare would yield around four to 500 trees. Um, she has uh, uh, two and second, she has five children. Or no, seven children, what am I talking about? She has two in university, she has two in secondary school, and she has three in primary school. So, you know, and she's on her own. Um, quote from her, I dream all of my children finishing school. I also wanna buy more sewing machines so that I can train women in the community to be self-sufficient and earn additional income. So again, community, it's about not just themselves, it's about their, 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 their extended family, which are their, her, their, her sisters in the, in the community. Um, and this is Odette Morakalet. Uh, she's been farming since 2000. Um, started for five years. Uh, she's, with, she's one of the founders of this Dukande Kawa Cooperative, which is one of the cooperatives that we engage with. Um, she started within, the cooperative is male and female. She started within the cooperative an all-female organization, and there's 140 members now. She's the, the head of that organization. Um, and, and that organization mission is uh, growing, collecting, and processing women-exclusive coffee and sell it to women, okay? So, you know, the, the, the common denominator between all these, these women are, is women, right? And not, not just that they are, but they want to engage with. Um, her biggest challenge um, is connecting buyers with women's coffee. It's, it's getting coffee to the market. And um, logistically, now, let's get back to, to uh, some of the processing for a second, is many of these farms are, there are no roads, and there are no towns, there's no village, uh, you know, there's no transportation. So the closest finishing agent we talked about earlier to, to you know, get the chaff off the coffee and get the coffee ready for export could be 50, 100, 200 kilometers away. How do you get the coffee to market? And the problem that they, the, the big problem they have uh, logistically is that they, time frame wise is there's a window of 48 hours between when they harvest the coffee and when it has to be finished. If you don't get it done in that 48 hour time frame, coffee will ferment. If the coffee ferments, you lose the crop. And that's where the bad guys come in. And you guys have probably all heard the, the word coyote. It's usually related to human trafficking and, and, and you know, that horrible topic. Um, but um, in this instance, human uh, coyotes, they go to these micro farms, they take advantage of these small families because they know that the, the family has no way to get the coffee to market. So instead of offering what they should be getting for the coffee, and let's just use a number of $2 a pound, they offer them 30 cents a pound. And the farmer has to make a decision. And this problem is not just in Rwanda, it's in every coffee growing country in the world. And I've been to several of them. Um, coffee, the farmer has to make a decision. Do I, do I take the 30 cents or do I lose the crop? They take the 30 cents. So coyotes are set up by the thousands in every single coffee growing region of every country that grows coffee. Uh, and they take full advantage of the, the plight of the farmer on the logistics side. So this is Mukabandora Yananti. 
and she's been farming since 2001. Uh, she joined this cooperative in 2005, and um, so the biggest benefits have been the price increases that she's been, gotten for her coffee. Um, she, with that, she's been able to bring electricity to her home. She's been able to uh, provide health care for her family. Again, not our definition of health care, but better than zero health care. Um, and uh, buy clothing and, and food um, for her family. Um, she was part of her income to buy, she bought a sewing machine as well. So she does repair work on clothing for other people in the community and gets some compensation for that. So in addition to her coffee crop, she's making some, she's bringing some income in there as well. And these are just some overall pictures. There's a picture of a group of them. And they are very strong, solid women from everything I've seen. And I wish I had gone there last year, but I'm really looking forward to going this year. Anybody been to Rwanda? No? I've done the Uganda to the north. Okay. Looks very familiar. Yeah, I mean, it's. Even the coffee uh, plantations and farms. Yeah, it's, it, 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 and they have the same issues going on there. It's just in Rwanda more than any other coffee producing country that we've engaged with, it's, it's female driven. And, and it's, it is wonderful to see because they, they're, they're really smart and, and they, they not only care about their crops and the, the quality of their crop, but they care about the people as well. And you won't, you won't see, you know, you'll, like you'll see some of that in Colombia and Brazil and, and Nicaragua and Honduras and Guatemala and Sumatra, but not as much as I've seen it there. And again, I haven't experienced it hands on and I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, just a couple quick pictures on, on um, our place. Uh, this is the coffee roaster that I told you about earlier using the low car uh, carbon footprint. Um, uh, those are the catalytic cleaners that we use uh, for the zero emissions, coffee grinder, packing machines, you know, kind of boring stuff. Um, we have partnered with, um, I think the last time I was here, again, we had only been engaged with college and universities. And what's happened since then is uh, we were approached by some Fortune 100 companies that have strong sustainable missions. And we've been we've engaged with them um, and kind of leveraged their marketing and their assets, their, their funds, to be able to even do more work around the world. And one of them is Bloomberg um, in, in Manhattan. And this is a, a quick clip um, on a project that we've gotten recently involved in about a year ago uh, with Bloomberg in Rwanda. Fixed it last time by unplugging and replugging. Oh, yeah, here it goes. Okay, let's start it again. It's about a five minute clip. I am a coffee grower. Before, I have been growing it differently than what you have taught here. Now I have realized what I need to do to make my coffee better. In 2008, I had a booklet from Patty Harris, our president of Bloomberg Philanthropies, and the booklet was about men, soldiers, who were raping and abusing women, and they were in a training program. I wanted to go and see, and I went. And my first journey was in the Congo, in a refugee camp, where there was 27,000 people living on rocks, covered by tarp. And it was probably the most severe inhumanity to other humans that I've ever witnessed in my entire life. And that's what got us started at Google. <laughs> Who 
there was a group of women who would literally meet a group of women who had been tortured and abused, who suffered from war, and they would start helping these women to rebuild their lives. Not taking care of the women, but helping them to rebuild their lives. Before the war in Rwanda, coffee was the primary source of income. And of course, during the war, crops was destroyed, communities was destroyed, and it took people a time to get back to that. The government made a decision. We want to do coffee again, and we want to do tourism. We needed a group that had the same ideas that was goal-driven, goal-centered, something measurable, sustainable, like the Bloomberg thinking, and we found sustainable harvest. We joined Sustainable Harvest with Women for Women, and we now fund them both. The concept of seed to cup is really emphasizing the notion that the farmer is a person with a face and who puts an effort, and that as the drinker of the cup, you should be thinking about them. coffee this morning and I thought it was wonderful. It's good to know we're working for a company that, uh, that really cares about uh, people around the world. I think it's a great thing that Bloomberg is working with these women who wanted to make them independent and I think it's great that you know we as employees are getting to see the fruits of their labor and get to experience it as well. Women came to our training and saying we have been getting 400 trees from the government and we really need to improve the quality. The first technique to teach, they have to know what color of the cherry they have to pick. The red cherry, it's increasing the quality and increasing their revenue at the end. These women didn't really know they can become a business women by growing coffee. Because most of the coffee washing station was owned by men. With the grant of Bloomberg, these women, they are on their coffee washing station now. Instead of making the exportation for all the coffee, we really hope that the big portion will stay in the country. And this will empower these women to trade directly with different customers in country and at the international market. These women are rock stars. They are not passive. They are not just sitting back and not being able to feed their families. They are moving forward. And they were so excited to learn about this and the energy that they conveyed to us was that these women are going to command their lives. They are going to absolutely transform the lives of themselves and their children. And nobody should take a cup of coffee for granted. Savor it, enjoy it, but honor the women who grew up for you. Women are resilient, and investment in a woman is an investment in the community, investment in the country, investment in the nation, because women immediately invest and put their returns into their family straight away. And so an investment in women is an investment in the world. Shown that we started 10 years ago, college university market, 18 to 22 year olds in that market typically. They all graduated six years ago, and now they're in the working world. And what we're finding is the culture of colleges aligns with this type of mission. Now we're seeing the culture change, and it takes a long time to change culture. It doesn't happen overnight, especially with large company like Bloomberg or Amazon or uh, the, the Microsoft, um, it takes years. But what's happening is the, the feeder now are the millennials who, who we started with. And, and we're seeing it happen in the business, what we call the business industry, enter the market. Um, and it's fascinating because I, I didn't really anticipate that when we started. And it just kind of morphed into its own thing. And, uh, 
and now we're engaged with a lot of these larger companies uh, because they want to align with a company that really is trying to do the right thing. And we fall on our face a lot and make a lot of mistakes, but um, we, we, every day we all go in the office and to wherever we are in the country or the world um, with our mission in mind. And um, it's not about the quality, it's not about the taste, it's not, it's about the people. So, with that said, um, if you guys have any questions, I can talk all night, but I'm not going to. Um, I will uh, kind of open it up if anybody has any questions. You're all dismissed. Kurt, when you get to the beginning, you showed the, the two markets I graphed. Yes. Um, I think 273 to 74 was like the highest price. 70, 77. It was 74. Oh, it would have been 74. Yeah, they're, 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 and then, that was like the perfect storm. So what happened then was there was a major frost in Brazil and in Colombia. Brazil was still is the number one producer in the world. Back then, Colombia was the number two producer in the world. Then there was a huge strike, stock strike, in Brazil at the same time. Um, and I think it was it was preceded by a drought season. So the yields just went through the floor. That was and, and, it, and, it, and the price went up. But guess what? The farmers didn't make any more that year of the market went up to $3. As a matter of fact, in 97, let me see. Uh, I'll get this. So that was the actual price of the No, that was, that was the price of the green coffee. That's before a coffee roaster puts, it, um, puts overhead on it or, or does anything to it. That's, that's the actual green commodity price. Not adjusted for inflation. Right? Not adjusted for inflation. These are real dollar figures. So you can see, this is kind of when I, I had my enlightened moment, okay? Uh, in the 70s, that's the spike that you're talking about, Yeah. okay? That was a huge market spike, and then we had another one in like 2000, right after we started. We launched in 2010, 2011. The, the market went crazy, and, and but that was the first time that I saw a market move like that. But I actually reached out to the farmers and I'm like, guys, you know, I'm now paying two dollars and eighty cents for a pound of coffee, and a year ago I could have been paying a dollar fifty. How much more are you guys making? It wasn't even a penny. It was, it was sick. We're all over the board. It really, it, our interns develop cost models for the farmers. And so there's a floor price, and we were talking again. So, so fair trade, for example, has a floor price of $1.60 a pound right now. Yeah. Most of our coffee farmers, their cost of production, no profit, no putting money aside, $1.68 a pound. That $1.60 is kind of a meaningless number. So what we'll do is we'll go to you as the farmer. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to you as the farmer, and, and we'll, we'll, you know, it's a simple spreadsheet, right? They, they don't even have access to the salary or anything like that. So what we'll do is put a simple spreadsheet together on the actual cost of production, you know, what's needed to you know, provide for their families, and that number could be two dollars and fifteen cents, it could be two dollars and eighteen cents, you know, it could be two dollars. I would say that on our average certified coffees, our dual, which is most of our coffees are dual certified. Are somewhere around 225 to 275 a pound, depending on where they are in the world. The market today, the March contract, let's trade five contracts a year. March contract is a dollar sixty. So, and, and what what our interns also do is follow up to make sure the funds go where they're supposed to go. So you know, again, fair trade is a great organization. But the follow through is like, okay, is the money, the money actually getting to the farmer? Or because there, there could be umpteen middlemen between the funds leaving here and the funds actually getting on the farm in Nicaragua or Rwanda or whatever the country is. So uh, we do the best we can um, to make sure that the funds actually channel all the way down. And one of the things I'm working on, I've been in Microsoft a couple of times. Uh, if we can do this, uh, IBM has just launched something for the consumer. But if we can do it on the production side for manufacturing in the agricultural world, we, we're, we're looking at a blockchain model where we get total transparency throughout the supply chain. Because so many middlemen, 
between the farmer and you, okay, the purchasing cost here. So, uh, you know, if you, if you set up the right blockchain model and you start to buy in by everybody, then you can, you can literally track that coffee right through the, the, the entire supply chain. And, and, that, and that's just for coffee, for really any agricultural product that produced around the world. How much is that to um, the dollars they're supposed to get to the farmer directly today? All of it? Of, of what we pay? Yeah. All of it. It's supposed to be? Yeah. Most of the coffees that we buy now, mm -hmm. we actually direct trade. Okay. Even though they're quote unquote fair trade certified yeah. and rainforest certified, we don't we don't go to a broker. We engage directly with farmers. And then what we do is we go to like I was in Papayan, Colombia recently, and um, they, we, there's there were like eleven thousand micro farmers in that region. Um, so what we we'll, we'll do is we we'll drive them down, we met a couple of the farmers, and then they have a formal cooperative. But if you wanted to engage with like a group in one particular area, so you know, if you think about it, which farmer, uh, like in Colombia, for extra property, would yield about 2,000 pounds a year. Okay. 2,000 pounds for us is really close to me now. It's, it's, it's really not a lot of money. So I got to get a lot of these micro farmers together, work with them to work together at, at, at home base. And then buy the, then, then export the coffee. So, so we know that the funds that we get don't go through any middle bank. It goes directly to bank account. It is then divvied up amongst the 12 farmers, for example, or 20 farmers that we're Yes? Yeah, so, like, I don't Do they, like, go and they shake down the trees? Because. No, they shake talking, down the farmers. Yeah, so, like, you were talking about how. Oh, do they, like, take them hostage? No, they don't take them hostage. I mean, yeah, it depends on how you consider hostage. They, they, they know. They first of all, they have a means of transportation. They have a truck, they have some kind of vehicle where they can get the coffee from point A to point B. Point A to point B could be 50 kilometers. Yeah. I'm the farmer at point A. I have no way to get to point B. Impossible. So, 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 as the coyote, I go to that farmer at point A and say, Look, we know you can't get it there. I can get it there. I'm going to give you 30 cents a pound, even though your coffee's worth two bucks a pound, and take it or leave it. And, and the problem is they have the time ticking against them. Yeah. If they could wait and try to pool their funds with somebody else, and you know, if somebody does have a truck that you know isn't using it today, they can borrow it and bring it back. They don't have that luxury. They've got a, literally a 48-hour window to yeah. get that coffee to market. So, but then that's only if they don't have like person who will take it because so if if for the for instance your farm they you have a way to get it out of there right for for the farmers that we engage yeah. with yes so yeah. if we, and if they don't have a way we create a way yeah. so part of the funds that will you know to get a truck in Nicaragua uh, we haven't done anything in Rwanda yet but in Nicaragua you know a few hundred dollars you can get yourself a truck right yeah, you, you'll, you'll get it from point A to point B and, 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 we, and that would be that that would be even before we start funding a, a K to five school, which is typically what we, we fund the thirty schools that we funded. They're typically K to five schools. Uh, before we even fund a school, we want to make sure they can get the coffee to market. If they can't get the coffee to market, then the K to five school is meaningless because they're not going to stick around long. I don't know if I answered your question properly. But, yeah, that's fine. But if you're the, okay, yes. You get coffee from point A to point B. How do you get it from these countries to the US? Okay, so it goes to the beneficial. Like, let's use Nicaragua because I'm most familiar with Nicaragua or Colombia. Um, the beneficial will get the coffee to, to uh, support. It's got, it, it typically comes on a boat, short answer. Okay? Uh, there are five major ports in the US Oakland, San Diego, Houston. Miami and uh, New Jersey. Okay, um, we actually did when we first started here. We, we were talking about a local roaster, and my question, you know, I talked, we talked to dinner, is, do you want local because you want to local, support a local business? Get that. I can't, I can't fight that. Do you want local because you want to have the lowest carbon footprint? 
you know, you want you know buy local potatoes or buy local produce or you know it's fresh local. But there's no local cost. So on the environmental side, what's the cheapest way to get it to Minnesota? Well, if it comes to Minnesota, it's going to come from two ports. It's either going to come from Oakland or it's going to come from New Jersey. And it's going to come to a local roaster here. Let's say you had a local roaster. It's going to get roasted and then get delivered. Usually by a van or truck or what have you. Um, the thing about roasting is you lose approximately 18% moisture content when you roast coffee. So if you're freighting 40,000 pounds of coffee from New Jersey to Minnesota to Minneapolis or St. Cloud, it's going to cost X. Take 18% less than that, and that's what you ship to Minneapolis. It's going to cost Y, and Y is going to be less than X. So in the carbon footprint of Y is going to be less than X. So the, the, there's there's a there's and we and I I've got to dig it up. I did I had some MIT interns figure this out for me. I'm not that smart, and um, and, and it, it was actually less of a carbon footprint to have the coffee roasted on a coast and bring it to the middle of the country than it is to bring it to the middle of the country, roast it, and then, and then deliver it from there. Well, that 40,000 pounds. I'm sorry? Of 40,000 pounds, which is 4,500 pounds, is all you know? Well, say 20% of 40,000 is, yeah, it's like 4,000. 40,000 is 8,000 pounds. Right. 4,000 pounds is 10%, right? So you're losing, okay, right. it's like, it's like seven, seven and a half thousand pounds of coffee. That's a lot. Yeah. Are you, like, when you are talking about your carbon neutrality, goal, are you talking about like Thank you. Nope, one second. Okay. One second.